A lot of people, uh, when I started talking to administration here, and I, and I brought up the idea literally last May, knowing I was going to be teaching this course in September, I said, I've got this, this group of uh, students that are studying social entrepreneurship, and I, you know, everything I've ever learned um, about what I, where I get the most out of my, my education has been through hands-on projects outside the classroom. So I was very interested in engaging with the EWB chapter here. And I was inspired because last year I was, I was given the, uh, the Medal of Excellence by Rutgers and I was at the event that was in February. And I saw the EWB documentary and I think Elizabeth, I don't know if you were at the event, but you know, uh, it, it got great recognition. Um, and I, I was very inspired and I talked to some of the students at the time and I, I've always had in the back of my mind that I wanted to do this. But when I started mentioning to administration that I wanted to, you know, have my MSC students work with the EWB students, they said, what is social entrepreneurship? So one of the things that I think um, what, what we all know has happened, right? In the United States alone, the United States government spends about $2 trillion a year in an attempt to eradicate poverty, okay? $2 trillion a year. And if you look at it on a per capita basis, right, across roughly 29, 30 federal programs. We basically give out the equivalent of about $24,000 per person. So if you do the aggregate, right, the numbers add up to like an 80-something thousand dollar per family government grant, if you will. Um, now, the average household in America makes about $23,000 a year. So you start to question, how could that be possible, okay? And, and the bottom line is there have been many, many, many attempts over hundreds of years to try to deal with social issues through governmental organizations and through charity. And for the most part, those efforts have not been successful. So what we've begun to see over the last 10 years is this tremendous change in mindset where instead of giving someone a fish, we're going to teach them, first of all, where to fish, you know, how to make the fishing rod, how to catch the fish, how to market the fish, okay, and then how to reinvest in the fishing business, okay? And so there's an opportunity to do something where you can use both your engineering and your business skills. And I realize I say business skills loosely because I know many of you are studying engineering and you have probably fairly limited professional experience. But combine them with your desire to do good. Okay, and as I go through my slides, you'll see the new models, right? The new business models that have emerged over the last few years. And I'm gonna talk about a lot of companies. So the gentleman that founded Engineers Without Borders, Professor Amadi, is that how you pronounce his last? Amade. Amade, Professor Amade. So Professor Amade, I know, came here to talk, and I had the benefit of seeing his talk. Um, and I think he speaks more at a very high level about the why, okay? He's, he speaks in a very inspirational way about how important it is to, in his words, not to eliminate poverty, but to enhance wealth. I'm going to speak more about the how and the what. I'm going to be maybe a little bit more on the ground and spend more time talking about very specific examples of both American entrepreneurs and international entrepreneurs and things that they are doing using engineering or science or technology related um, inputs to, to bring real profound impact to different societies and different people, okay? So, you know, we're sitting here today in a world where, and many of my students, I put this slide up, we had an entire class on um, the challenges of what it's like to live in cities like Mexico City with 20-something million people or Shanghai <coughs> or, ben, or, or um, you know, Lagos, Nigeria. And the emotion that, that erupted in my classroom um, was profound, right? Because this is an issue that is so uh, destructive of people's dignity because it consumes so much of their time, right? And it's a horrendous issue. So we have all of these issues around at, at the very bottom of the pyramid, right? When I talk about the bottom of the pyramid, does anybody have, a, is that a phrase that means anything to everybody? So the bottom of the pyramid is 
the sense that you've got in, in, in the globe, about 5 billion people live on the equivalent of about $2 a day, okay? And so the problem is, is that for, for hundreds of years, um, there's always been this assumption that people that live on $2 a day are not worthy of investment. Um, they're not worthy of the time of industrial organizations or others and as a result of that, they, they have to live through all kinds of horrendous diseases that kill their young, right? They've got to deal with this. They, they go without food. So what we're seeing today in terms of um, the way social organizations are beginning to impact, you know, these kinds of problems, um, and just in one specific example, right, global annual deaths, um, you know, which is something that we've not been able to eradicate despite a tremendous amount of investment. Um, I'm not even going to go through the agenda we're going to talk through it, is I want to talk about why some of these problems that have been so intractable for so long are no longer able to be addressed by the, the traditional business models, right? So I'm putting up a slide that I suspect, anybody ever see the business model canvas before? Business model canvas is something that is very, very popular in Silicon Valley and, and essentially any innovation ecosystem where people are building technology-based companies and it's replacing business plans because the, the belief is business plans are obsolete before you hit the save button. So you no longer go to a, an investor with a 40-page business plan that you've sweated over for three months. There's no time for that. Things are moving too quickly. So when you sit down and try to raise money today, you talk about your business model. And in the world of social impact, the, first, the business model that's been popular for a long time in addressing these bottom of the pyramid types of market opportunities, right? Tier five, where you've got five billion people, has been what is called a leveraged nonprofit, okay? And these are typically organizations that get their money through government grants or foundations, okay? So this is basically, in, in a word, it's charity. Okay? Now, there are some organizations, and I'm going to talk about One World Health in a little while, that are being very effective by taking money from the Clinton Global Initiative. Okay? So I'm not here to say that this model doesn't work, but it's less popular than it used to be. And I'll talk about One World Health and Barefoot College in Bangladesh and India, which is an incredible um, grassroots college that is training extremely impoverished people to be solar engineers for example, okay? Incredibly inspirational. The second model, and I'm going to talk about some examples of this, and by the way, one of the, one of the implications of the fact that these uh, foundation or charitable organizations are less um, effective is that at my own school, HALT, the HALT Global Case Challenge is something we've been running for about five years. And Mr. HALT, Swedish gentleman, every year would donate a million dollars to the Clinton Global Initiative to focus on a specific problem. So two years ago, the, the problem was, the focus was on the availability of clean water. And we gave a million dollars to an organization called water.org that is most famously represented by its front person, Matt Damon. Okay, last year, it was about the eradication of global poverty. What we've learned is that when we give a million dollars to the non-governmental organization, things do not happen nearly as quickly or as productively as we would like. So we are switching to a new model where we will actually give the million dollars directly to the startup team, right, to the new venture founders. And these are all students. These are students from all over the world. So we run competitions on all six campuses, and each of those competitions is almost like an NCAA, you know, March Madness bracket. And the winners of all of those brackets then come to New York and Clinton and Muhammad Yunus, the Nobel Prize winning economist and professor who created the microfinance industry are judges. And this year what will happen is a team of students will actually be given the ability to be incubated within our accelerator and we will give them a million dollars and they will get to actually work on making their idea come to life. So for anybody in the classroom that, you know, I'm going to talk about some other competitions a little bit later that may be more engineering oriented, right? Just to give you some other things that you might think about. Not that engineering students don't already have enough to do. I, I, I understand that. But just to talk about other things that are going on on the planet that 
you know, that I think are very interesting, at least to know about, if not to participate in. But this is a pretty interesting indication that, you know, after donating a million dollars three, four years in a row, we're not seeing the kind of impact, we're not seeing the kind of progress that we had hoped. And so now we're going to ask the entrepreneurial energy to be unleashed. And I'm going to get to that in a second. So there's a second model, which is a hybrid nonprofit. And I'm going to talk about some incredible companies. Uh, and I'm going to show you some pictures and some examples and describe what they do. But what, what these people do is they use what they call differential pricing. And so Aura Lab provides intraocular lenses to people that have had cataracts. And you know, in the, in the bottom of the pyramid, people could not afford these intraocular lenses because it would cost them hundreds of dollars to purchase. So Aura Lab has been able to manufacture these for about $2 a piece. They have completely crushed the cost of these things, right, through a remarkable cost reduction process in the way that they manufacture. What they do is they will sell them at market to patients that can afford them, but they will also use their surplus to give them to people that cannot afford them. So they're funding their mission by generating profits, but they're allocating a lot of money to those that cannot afford them. The same thing with Aravind in India. Okay, Aravind in India happens to be now the world's, um, believe it or not, highest quality, lowest cost provider of cardiovascular health services. And they also will find people that are unable to have uh, an open heart surgery, and they will operate for free. But they will, they will do that only when the patient does not have the means to pay, but they will pay market rates when the patient can pay. And they're delivering incredibly high quality at a very, very low price point. And it's actually being introduced outside of um, you know, places like India, as an example. Now, the most current model is what we will call a social business. And a social business is where there is no shame in making a profit. That the belief is, is that in order to carry out your mission and in order to be able to have a sustainable ongoing business long term, that you need to create a profit. And the, the founder of this message is actually the Nobel Prize winner himself, Muhammad Yunus. And he is an extremely um, He's very emphatic about, you know, there should be no such thing as charity, that he'd rather see people, you know, have the dignity of working. And so giving everybody the opportunity to actually be able to pay for what they get and employing people. And we're going to see some amazing examples of that. Okay? So, and I'm going to go through a lot of different U.S. ventures here, as well as some international ones, to give you an example of what some of these social businesses are, again, with a real eye on technology. Got to remember. So I have spoken at length publicly on the TEDx circuit and in other places about what I'm calling the entrepreneurial renaissance. All right? and, and what I'm saying basically is that there was a time when if you hung out in Silicon Valley, you would practice this art of advanced technology entrepreneurship. This is a completely global phenomenon. It's happening in every corner of the globe. I'm seeing as much innovation coming out of Estonia and Bangalore and Shenzhen and uh, Newfoundland. People of your generation, I think, have been inspired by the consumerization of technology. And we've all seen all of these stories. I'm, I'm sure many of you, how many people have seen the social network, for example, the story about Facebook, right? It's actually a pretty damn good uh, story of the way that the process works with all of the intrigue and all of the backstabbing that happens because it is a brutal and Darwinian sport for sure. But I think a lot of us have gotten to know about some of these entrepreneurs. They've been celebrated. Now, it's not an easy life, right? It's a very, very challenging, uh, but it's a very rewarding uh, career choice. But this is no longer the province of people that have masters in double E from Stanford or Berkeley or MIT. This is a global phenomena. I've got students coming from all over the world bringing me business plans constantly saying, I want to start this business. And many of your generation, they're not just traditional ventures, they're social ventures. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about startup stuff real quick and what that means. I also want, and, and, and there's, not surprisingly, there's at least half of the room are women. If we were to have this chat even five years ago, I would be, I wouldn't have the same ability to say how pervasive it is that women today 
are starting technology companies. Okay? It's no longer something that just guys do anymore. Uh, increasingly, women are starting technology companies. Heather Stroll has come up with something which is an EKG machine for stroke. So you can do very rapid triage. When someone goes, if someone is having stroke-like symptoms, you go into the emergency room and a doctor can determine very, very quickly whether or not you've got to put them on a certain protocol to prevent them from having severe damage. Um, Heather is, is trying to provide a lot more automation and workflow for caregivers. So if you have a family member that's got a chronic illness or, or an elderly uh, family member and they require a lot of care, she's created sort of a collaboration system so that nurses and doctors and family members and other caregivers can all collaborate so that you don't over medicate or under medicate. So there's a lot of very different types of technologies that are being developed and led into the marketplace by women including a very young woman who was not able to afford to go to college because her father had gotten laid off and she, she had to go apply for scholarships. And she wound up applying for 600 scholarships. And she realized that each scholarship required a different form. And she said, I'm going to be the last generation that's got to go through this ridiculously, unnecessarily redundant and complex and unproductive process. And so she's now convinced hundreds of universities to accept a common form for filing for a scholarship, right? And I can go on and on, but there's a lot of really great examples. But the good news is women are in this game like never before. Okay? So I'm a Springsteen guy. I wear, I wear it on my sleeve, right? We're all, you know, in, in, in the words of Springsteen, we're all working on a dream, right? But the challenge is when you work on a dream, there are some people that don't necessarily want to see you achieve that dream. So if I go back to an Italian guy from the 1500s, um, I, you know, this is the essence of the challenge of what it is to build an entrepreneurial venture. So I'm just going to ask you to just take 15 seconds and read that, okay? Because it's as true today as it's ever been. And the message is that Change is, not, is, is never easy, right? And if you are a change agent, if you are an entrepreneur, if you're trying to change the world, that's what entrepreneurs basically do. They're trying to make the world a better place. There are always people that profit under the old way of doing things, that will resist any new approach, okay? Especially in regulated industries. And especially when you are starting to delve into issues which have a lot of social and therefore emotional impact, right? So there's a lot of people that will try to step in and prevent you from achieving what it is that you want to achieve. Okay, so it takes a lot of courage and it takes a lot of persistence to do the kinds of things. Now, Kennedy says it in quite a, a much more abbreviated and, and a lot more current term, right? But this is really what social entrepreneurs are all about. Okay, I dream, dream of things that never were and I ask why not, okay? So that's what social entrepreneurs are asking themselves all the time. Why not? Why can't we do it that way? Okay? But change is a motivator and it has its enemies. So we look at this guy, okay, and we take a lot of inspiration from what he did. But we're now going to try to apply those skills, right? And, and here's Jobs talking about what it takes. And he was referring to himself in many ways because he was a rebel. He was a troublemaker. He was a radical. He did disrupt more industries than anybody that's ever lived before. Right? You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them, but the only thing you cannot do is ignore them because they change things. They push the human race forward. And while some see them as crazy, we see genius because the ones who are crazy enough to think that they can change the world are the ones who do. Okay? And he did in an extraordinary way. Okay? So when you think about innovation and entrepreneurship, there are two ways to innovate. There are these conceptual innovators that have this vision, and they never let it go. So Picasso is a great example of that. Okay? He came on the scene as a very young artist with an extremely different approach and revolutionized his, war, his, his industry. Okay? Steve Jobs clearly is in that mold. There are very few people that have that level of vision and confidence. If we had more time, I would show you a video of Steve Jobs when he was in his 20s, talking about what it was like when he walked into the Xerox Palo Alto Research Labs in the late 1970s and saw 
the graphical user interface for the first time. And he said, I saw the future. He said, in 10 minutes, I knew that this is what the future of computing was like. Now, back then, computing was a mainframe computer in a highly secure room, highly you know, air-conditioned with security guards around it. And you went in, and you threw a bunch of punch cards into a card reader, right? Beyond anything you can conceive of with your iPhones and your iPads. But it was, the, it was nowhere near personal in any way, right? It was this incredibly impersonal experience. It was like working with a robot. And he saw 30 years ago where this was going, okay? And so that level of confidence, of course, drives things. But far more typical, far more typical is the Shazan approach, okay? Uh, where progress comes and fits and starts. You make some progress, you hit a plateau, you learn, you re-engage the marketplace, and so in the world of startup taxonomy, um, we talk about something called the lean startup. And the lean startup is a methodology that says that it's very rare that any of us have a crystal ball. It's very difficult for us to <coughs> predict what people want. Steve Jobs had an uncanny ability. He's one in a billion people that could do that. But most of us put our pants on one leg at a time. And we need to go and we need to do a lot of work very humbly in the marketplace, asking people what they need, not assuming that we know, but letting them tell us and being humble enough to change it when it doesn't work. Okay? And so, you know, the, the methodology very simply is it's just constant iteration, constant learning, constant validation. Okay? Now, the, I'm not even going to spend more than 30 seconds on this, but the, the mantra is something called product market fit. You do not invest in scaling your business until you are absolutely certain that the market wants what you've got. Okay? And I'm going to talk about a great example of British Petroleum bringing stoves into rural India, spending billions of dollars giving away stoves, but yet not recognizing that the average Indian could not afford the wood pellets that were required to actually use these stoves. So they thought that they had this great idea and they were being very generous and they were giving away billions of dollars of stoves, but they became basically doorstops because no one really went into the market and tested them. I'm going to talk about an extremely different approach where people actually go and live in rural India, live in, in the villages in, in Africa, live with the people and understand what they need and give them what they need. Very, very different, okay? Using the same principles that I've used for 25 years as a technology entrepreneur, okay? So now Edison's Innovation Laboratory, right, here in, in New Jersey was a precursor of the lean startup. It turns out that in many ways, Edison's Innovation Factory was a perfect model for the lean startup, okay? We're talking about 140 years ago. He built the first industrial research and development complex. And he was so far ahead of his time. He was all about rapid prototyping and experimentation. And he was very much into open innovation. So unlike a lot of very brilliant inventors who work alone, Edison recognized that there was a lot of brain power outside the four walls of his experimentation factory. So he was very collaborative. So he had a network of hundreds of scientists and engineers that he would work with. And, and as, as I think you all know the famous quote, right? It's not failing, it's learning about another way things don't work. So he was all about failure was not anything other than just a learning opportunity. And he designed his factory to be able to crank out thousands of experiments until he finally got it right. And then he put together the infrastructure that created the electrical grid, right? So he was one of those crazy guys that Steve Jobs talked about. There was no electrical grid before Edison. He created General Electric, they created the grid. Okay? Now, what I love about Edison, and I think you'll see by this quote, this was in 1931. This was 90 years ago. Look at, look at what he was talking about 90 years ago. It's remarkable. I don't think anybody was thinking about this stuff 90 years ago. Right? So you want to talk about someone who had vision. Okay? Extraordinary. Okay? So we're going to talk about environmental sustainability as, as another social venture, but I just want to talk about the relevance of Edison and his principles, where he was 100 years ahead of his time, very much like Jobs was. Okay? 
So if you're going to be a social entrepreneur, what are some of the characteristics that are important? I'm going to go through these very quickly. Okay? Ideology does not help you. Okay? It's, you've got to be focused on solving the problem. Now, I can't probably be speaking to a better group of people than engineers when I think about people that are pragmatic. Okay? But it's not about your religious or your social ideology. It's about I see a problem and I'm going to try to figure out a way to come up with solving this problem. Engineers are perfect. Okay? We're talking about practical solutions, not like the BP thing where we give away something that's not maintainable and, and it's certainly not affordable. Okay? Um, it's not about holding on to my idea. It's about proving that it works and sharing it. So a lot of these ideas you're going to see, they get very viral and you'll see very uh, significant replication around the globe. And number five, you can't jump in. If you wait until you get all the capital you need, it's never going to happen. Okay, so you've got to have a certain leap of faith to do that. Okay, I'm, gonna, I'm not even going to bother going through the, the next five. Okay, so one of the people that really pioneered social ventures is a gentleman by the name of Paul Polak. And his message was, if you want investors, you need a profit stream. It's not inappropriate, it's not wrong to try to create money to help people. So he has created social ventures with bringing treadle pumps to market, drip irrigation systems, donkey carts, rice fertilizers, water storage. So when you think about EWB, right, this guy is clearly a kindred spirit. And he's been building social ventures around the world now for almost 40 years. And his most current product is where he's bringing potable water to rural villages in India. Okay? It's a for-profit business. Okay? But it allows him to provide clean drinking water and make enough profits to build distribution and get water into the poorest villages. Okay? So with that inspiration, let's look at some of the current ventures. Okay? Um, Nigerian gentleman who came through an IBM Smart Camp competition in Boston three years ago when I met him. And he was very, very aghast with the drug counterfeiting that was happening in Africa. And how many people were consuming rat poison and all kinds of horrendous substitutes thinking that they were actually taking medicine that was good for them and how many people it was killing. So he leveraged the cell phone infrastructure. Right? There's no question, everyone's got a feature phone and everyone knows what SMS was. So he created an incredibly simple solution that would allow you to send a text to the drug company and they would validate whether the lot number was a lot number that they had shipped. An incredibly simple solution, but he has probably saved many, many people from getting very sick or dying with that simple solution. And this is an example, I'm gonna talk about funding, but the Acumen Fund is a new kind of investor it's an investor that doesn't just look at your financial return, they look at your blended return. They look at your financial return plus your social impact. So Sproxel is a perfect example of a blended venture and Acumen is the ideal investor behind that. Now here's another example. Woman named Victoria Hale. Victoria is the head of the first ever nonprofit pharmaceutical company called One World Health. Victoria has been given many awards and what she's basically done is she says, yes, we have the big three, we have HIV, we have malaria, we have TB, but we have a lot of other diseases that kill a lot of kids around the world with parasites, okay? And what she was able to do is she was able to identify uh, different types of drugs that were not patented in um, emerging economies, right? In bottom of the pyramid kinds of markets and she was able to go through clinical trials, right? So the, in most pharmaceuticals today cost anywhere from 800 million to a billion plus to go through clinical trial before they get approved by the Food and Drug Administration or through other organizations, right? Other regulatory bodies. She is able to bring drugs to market spending between 10 and 15 million dollars, okay? Just a small, small fraction because she's using the IP that has already been developed by these large pharmaceutical companies, they are not targeting these specific markets, these specific diseases. And so she's done a tremendous amount of work. She's been at this for about 10 years. She's won many, many awards. And she's been funded by the Gates Foundation and by the Clinton Global Initiative. So she is one person who is you know, benefiting from charity, but she's doing extraordinary work, having really high impact around the world. 
And there's a lot on, on all the people I'm going to talk about. If you're interested in learning more, they're online for sure. Okay? Now, uh, okay, I'll go back to this right. I'm going to talk about a company called Diagnostics for All. Diagnostics for All, I'll let you read about them for a second. Okay? They came through an MIT 100K entrepreneurship competition when I was a judge back in 2008. So let me just let you read what they do. Okay, so I know some of you have biomed uh, backgrounds or you know chemistry backgrounds, biochemistry backgrounds. So I'm just trying to provide some relevant examples to each of you. So it turns out this was a team of people that uh, came from the Middle East, won the MIT 100K, and then because of the incredible impact that this had on the competition and the fact that they wound up getting all this visibility by winning the competition, they recruited a woman named Una Ryan. Una was a serial CEO in the Boston biotech community. So just another example of how incredibly uh, significant this, this trend is becoming, where you're attracting people that have had incredible success in the for-profit world trying to make good, right? trying to actually have social impact. So Una is now the CEO of Diagnostics for All, um, and they're, they're also uh, growing very significantly. Okay? Just some examples on the left, you've got some sheets of their devices, uh, some of the wicking fluid, some of the colorimetric output, and on the right-hand side you can see their liver function test. Okay, all made of paper, extremely inexpensive. Okay. Now, David Green is a classic, hardcore Silicon Valley entrepreneur who was inspired to begin to address the problem of eye diseases. And so he, for many years, was a very successful entrepreneur in the advanced technology world, and he decided that he would begin to work with people that had cataracts. And when he began to look at the problem, he saw that uh, the cost of these things was ridiculous. And it just really defied logic in his mind why people would have to pay so much money for what appeared to be relatively simple devices. So he spent a lot of time going around the world, going to the top manufacturers, you know, being invited in, looking at their manufacturing processes, looking at their research processes, and said, I'm going to figure out a way to design these myself using best practices in manufacturing, and he, and he said, I'm going to reverse engineer this thing where I can actually deliver this to the market at the same quality that people charging hundreds of dollars a year are delivering at $2 a device, okay? And he figured it out, okay? When you talk about being on a mission from God, he figured it out. So he's now doing intraocular devices. He's using differential pricing. He donates these to people that cannot afford them but he sells them to those that can. Uh, and he's now into sutures, and he's, he's really expanding his product set using the same principles that allowed him you know, to, to make uh, Oral Lab one of the leading uh, providers of intraocular lenses in the world, period. Okay? And another Silicon Valley entrepreneur, um, Robert Truckenberg, uh, created this company called Benetech. Now, he was running a company, and he got inspired because of a family friend that was going blind. And he decided he would start to think about, is there a way for me to create reading devices for the blind? And he went to his investors and he said, you know, I've been thinking about this project. What do you think? Now, they had just written him a $25 million check. And they said, I'm sorry, but, you know, we've invested in you to profit. You know, we can't afford you to be distracted. So he created this nonprofit on the side as a starting point. And he had a friend of his who was a lawyer that helped him set up this nonprofit. And eventually, it started to get some traction. So he actually left his core business. And he started this company called Benetech. And they've now created a national library for the blind. And very much like they're doing with, um, like, like Oralab is doing, they're selling them to those who can afford them and giving them away. So this is another example of someone who's using technology you know, as a way to really help people. Okay? He's gotten lots of uh, positive notoriety for what he's done. Okay? Uh, I, I got this out of order. That, that, that was placed separately. Um, in many, many parts of the world where people do not have um, the opportunity to work in technology industries, 
uh, they wind up doing things that are well below their means, right? There's a woman, um, Linda Rotenberg, who started a group called Endeavor in Latin America because she was inspired. She met a taxi cab driver that had a PhD in engineering and said, this has got to stop. So she created this extraordinary entrepreneurial ecosystem to make sure that people were employed, matching their brains, matching their intellect. So this is another gentleman, Orlando Bonilla, um, who saw the incredible talent that people had that wanted to write software. And there was really no vehicle to do that. So he actually created a program, uh, he created an organization that would bring people to work and he would find funding for people that had no jobs and they would start doing coding projects for large software companies. Okay, so again, giving people the dignity of a paycheck. So I'm just trying to show examples across a lot of the disciplines that I suspect are represented in the room tonight. Okay, and that's their headquarters. Okay, so some other things that I think are very inspirational around bottom of the pyramid. Um, this, what I'm going to talk about now is going to be about uh, design thinking. So when I talk about design thinking, design thinking is what has guided Apple for the last 30 years to design the kind of products that you're used to, right? That are extremely different than a lot of the other hardware and device products that we've had, right? And the incredible ergonomics and the incredible user experience that goes into an Apple product. So I wanna talk about user experience and I'm quoting here Frank Lloyd Wright, a very famous American architect. Okay, whenever you design anything, consider it in its larger context, whatever that environment might be. So, Anybody know the, the firm known as IDEO? Anybody know IDEO? IDEO is the world's most prominent innovation consultancy. It would be probably one of the coolest places that you guys could get a job. Honest to God, if I was graduating from Rutgers today, be a place I'd be thinking about very seriously. So IDEO talks about design thinking, right? And, and one of the things they talk about is you know, a focus on human values, empathy for the people that you were designing for, and p feedback from these users is fundamental to good design, okay? Um, embrace experimentation. Prototyping is not just a way to validate your ideas, an integral part of the innovation process. You build to think and learn, okay? Now, why am I putting these slides up? So there's a great example of this, okay? So we talked about global annual deaths from HIV, TB, and malaria. The greatest of all is this thing called indoor air pollution, okay? Indoor air pollution, where people are burning uh, coal or carcinogenic things that are in their households, and young kids are dying, and people are dying because they're home cooking over these stoves. So here's one attempt to eradicate indoor air pollution, okay? Young woman, Jessica Matthews, Nigerian woman, who went back to Nigeria after she completed her undergraduate degree at Harvard and said you know, she saw some extremely poor kids playing with a soccer ball, and she said, look at how, even though they're extremely poor, look at how joyful these kids are. Play is just one of those things that, you know, is just such a universal shared experience. Is there a way to do something with that? And she had this extremely simple idea. What if you could capture and store energy in a soccer ball? What if you could use that energy to light the hut at nighttime? What if you could use that energy, you know, to, to power up your cell phone? Because a lot of these people spend 20% of their income every month just so they can charge their cell phones, okay? What if you could prevent them from burning kerosene so they don't have to breathe in carcinogens, which gives them cancer? And, and lo and behold, the Uncharted Play organization was born and the Socket Soccer Ball was created, okay? An extraordinarily simple but profound idea, okay? And Jessica today is at Harvard Business School. She started a few, about a month and a half ago. Um, she'll be one of the teams that my MSc students will be working with, and uh, very inspirational. Now, let's talk about a, a, a really great example, right? For all of you engineers, you wanna talk about designing, uh, understanding human values. So there's a company called BioLite, and BioLite is looking at also trying to reduce indoor air pollution, okay? And you can see uh, on the curve on the left what, what happens when you're burning on an open fire in the hut, what happens when you're using a more traditional rocket stove, and how BioLite is able to dramatically reduce carbon monoxide and particulate matter, okay? Significant reductions. Now the challenge is 
when you burn wood, wood gives food a certain flavor. So a lot of people in these different villages, whether they be in Africa or India or in China or in um, um, Latin America, they, they are addicted to that flavor. And men being men, and this is a sad thing to say, but it's true, they will say, I don't care if there's indoor air pollution. I'm not cooking the food. My wife is. My food doesn't taste very good. I'm going to go back to the old way of cooking. Okay? So not only do you have to make these things appealing for the woman, but you've got to make them appealing for the man as well. I'll talk about how they figured out how to do that. But you don't get that by sitting in your cube in Silicon Valley or Boston or by sitting in your lab here in Piscataway. Right? So how do you solve a problem of indoor air pollution with a product? Right? Can it be done physically? Do people want to use it? And can you get people to buy it at an affordable price? So can wood burn as cleanly as LPG without reliance on electricity or processed fuels? Right? So these guys came up with a very, very low cost construction. Okay? 25 cost of goods, $40 retail. So it's clearly a social venture. They're selling it. Okay, they're consuming 50% less wood, so you have to chop a lot less wood, so it's productive. 95% reduction in the amount of smoke emitted into the home, and eliminates almost entirely black carbon. And very much like the socket, soccer ball, it generates electricity. So you can light your home, you can charge your cell phone, and of course you can cook your food. Now, it uses wood. Okay, so we have a technology, but do, do people like it better than what they have? And this is called product management, okay? This is where an engineer will work with a product manager and say, what does the market really want? What features, how valuable, what regions, which woman? These are not simple questions to answer if you want to really do these justice. So they're using the same wood. So it was designed so you can use the same wood that they've already been using traditionally, okay? You want to be able to prepare local cuisine. So in India, you have a lot of flatbreads. Okay? In Latin America, you have these large tortillas, as an example. But in Africa, they cook a lot of stews. So you have to have a different design. Okay? And I'll go back to that in a second. But you know, this, the Indian stove will not work in Africa because what they eat is very different. And so you have to take the same general platform and then think about how you actually make this useful, compelling, captivating to people of that culture. And that's why I love this project. So the entrepreneur that I got to know, a gentleman by the name of Ethan Kay, 30-year-old um, guy, just got his PhD from Oxford, literally submitted his dissertation about two weeks ago. And Ethan went and lived in these villages. Okay? He hung out in these villages with people in India, hung out in Ghana, hung out in Kenya, and he spent time with these people. And he lived with them, and he got to know who they were. So it made these products extremely relevant right? And he, his entire PhD is based on that work, okay? It's really inspirational to me, as you can probably tell, okay? So this is a huge market opportunity, right? 1.2 billion people, 70% in rural areas, right? 855 million people using biomass cooking, okay? Half a billion people have no electricity, so they have the ability to use this, okay? And what I think is interesting is the economics, okay? You can save 50 kilograms of wood per month, so you save the family $2 a month, which in a, in a family that only makes two bucks a day is real money. You save them four bucks on electricity, it's a seven month payback for the family. They can be financed through microfinance loans, okay? Because it's a small purchase price, and they get carbon credits. So this is a brilliant example of design thinking, okay, engineering thinking, being brought into the bottom of the pyramid to design products that are having a real impact on people's health um, and are going to be very, very useful. Okay, so let me look at a couple of other examples now. I want to talk about another thing. So for those of you who may not be ready to take the entrepreneurial leap yet and you want to go work for a large Fortune 500 company, there's a way that you too can participate in what's happening, okay? So I didn't put this innovation thing in backwards. I did it to highlight that we're going to talk about reverse innovation, okay? And what reverse innovation is all about is it is a complete change in thinking. It used to be 
all of us arrogant imperialistic Westerners would say, okay, now that all of our technology is obsolete, let's go dump it in Bangladesh or let's go dump it in Botswana because we can't sell it anymore through Best Buy, okay? No one's buying it, so we'll go dump it. That, and that was the traditional path. Technology rolled down the bottom of the pyramid, okay? We discarded our obsolete junk and they would buy it. The message is completely different now. The message is that there's a new path. Let's start by looking at the needs at the bottom of the pyramid, very much like Ethan did with BioLite, and let us design products that are uniquely targeted to them, and then let's bring them back into the West, right? Because look at the economic crisis that we're going through. Look at what's happening in our healthcare system, for example. Look what's happening with public infrastructure. So one of the things that um, I think is very cool is that, um, and I won't even touch this one, but General Electric, obviously one of the world's great companies, and I'm sure some of you are probably interviewing with them or hoping to interview with them. General Electric was very concerned that they were hearing from a lot of uh, medical doctors in poor rural villages in China and India that they were not able to have access to electrocardiograms to help their patients because they were insanely expensive. They were at least 10,000 USD. They were not portable. They were not reliable. They were very, very um, fragile. They could not be transported. So what GE said, very much like Ethan at BioLite, how do we work backwards? How much can they afford? They could probably afford a device that would be about $200. It has to be battery powered because there's no electricity out there. It's got to be very portable. The doctor's got to be able to carry it around because most of these people are not driving around in cars. Okay? And it's got to be incredibly rugged and reliable because they're going over roads with potholes. So GE comes up with the following. They come up with a battery powered, fully portable electrocardiogram machine for about $200 USD so that any rural doctor is now able to go out into his patient base as he goes and makes house calls and he's able to, you know, use the EKG machine in his, in his daily medical practice. What happened was is that this, I, this device is so successful, it's so effective that now people in the United States and Canada and the Western world are starting to buy it. So doctors in more rural areas here in the U.S. are saying, why should I pay $10,000 for an EKG machine when I've got a perfectly good machine that I can spend 200 bucks on and it does everything I need it to do, right? So there's a lot of opportunity for those of you who want to do social good, who also want to apply your engineering and your scientific skills, but are not yet quite ready to jump into the entrepreneurial waters to say there's another way to go do this that could be very professionally and psychologically satisfying. Okay? It's, a very, it's, a, it's the beginning of, I think, a massive trend because of the, the global economy. Okay? Um, I'm going to skip through that. So let me talk very quickly about some competition. So Dartmouth runs a competition every year. And Dartmouth ran a competition last year which was called the $300 house. Could you design a house that could withstand wind and rain and snow and have some level of insulation that would give people the dignity to be able to, you know, live in it versus a shack or a mud hut for $300? And they came up with a design both for rural villages as well as for urban areas, okay? Now, Stanford University has a course and it's a design course called Design for Extreme Poverty, okay? And that's a course I would love to teach at Rutgers at some point, but that's exactly what you get when you talk about designing for extreme poverty. You get $300 houses, you get $200 EKG machines, you get $40 stoves, okay? So this is what's happening around the world, right? And how many of you are familiar with the X Prize? Anybody, anybody? Um, Tell me what the XPRIZE is about. It's uh, a large amount of money, I think a couple million dollars yeah. for, for it to go into space. Well, it started out, um, I mean, you're right. So right now, the XPRIZE for, car for space cargo, right? So the XPRIZE was created by a, a very successful entrepreneur, Peter Diamandis, who started offering large cash prizes to incentivize people to solve major social issues. So this is something that has gotten a tremendous amount of momentum. And I'll just show you a couple of things that have happened here, right? So they started doing things where you can actually, you know, have private spacecraft. 
So Richard Branson, who is very well known from Virgin Atlantic and, and, and the Virgin brands, um, is a person that's been behind the winning team, Spaceship One. That's Peter Diamandis, the founder of the XPRIZE. But because of the success they had with the space and the cargo piece, they're now doing XPRIZE competitions in education, in energy, in space exploration, in the life sciences. And this is basically an open source competition where you bring together a team of colleagues and you submit your, your entry. Okay? It's a pretty extraordinary opportunity to practice your skills. Okay, so let's talk about some changes, okay? Changes in the way these things get financed, okay? So the bottom line is there was this cliche for a very long time. If you dream it, you can do it. But there was always a caveat. If you could get the money to do it, okay? And that's always been a challenge. So where do you get the money, okay? Now the good news is there's a completely new approach that there are a lot of investors that have emerged that have the same idealism as you folks do. Okay, and they're not about just, I'm here to make a lot of money. I don't really care what you do, just make me a return. So this guy, Jed Emerson, has pioneered this blended impact, this double or triple bottom line metric. And so a lot of investors have emerged, including the Acumen Fund and Endeavor, that are following these principles. Okay, now crowdfunding is something that is also quite interesting. Does anybody, has anybody ever used a crowdfunding site to raise money for a project. Do you guys know what crowdfunding is? Yeah, please tell me. Global giving. Global giving? And what was it for your own project? Yes, yes. What was your experience it's, with it? I mean, it's great. I yeah. You one month uh, as a way to raise uh, $5,000. And if you were able to do that within the month, they believe that you have enough back end to be part of the organization. And the organization has tons of philanthropy. It's great. Philanthropy. Okay, cool. It's great. You use for crowd rise as well? Great. You had your hand up as well? But a site similar to this. Yeah. We tried to use it to um, start a new yearbook at the School of Engineering. Yeah. Yeah. We tried to fundraise for it. Uh, okay. And was it Kickstarter? Uh, I believe so, yeah. Okay, yeah. So I'll, I'll put a couple more up on the next page. But these are a little bit more socially focused, right? Crowd rise and start some good. Uh, but there are a lot of other ones that are more general. So you've got Kickstarter, which is the biggest of the, of the bunch right now. They'll, they'll, they'll process about 150 million USD this year. So they're becoming a real force in terms of uh, finance. If you're into the, so my, my RUTV friends in the back of the room, the people that are actually filming us tonight, right? If you've got aspirations to create independent films, Indiegogo is where you go crowdsource or crowdfund for independent films. And if you're an aspiring artist, like children's books or stuff like that, you would go to something like Artspire to fund your, you know, to fund uh, what you're working on, okay? So this is something that didn't even exist two years ago. American law has changed. There is such a recognition that we need to fuel entrepreneurial energy in this country that laws that have been on the books since the 1930s have been completely overturned so that we will allow all of us to become citizen activists and citizen investors. So you can now fund projects that inspire you. That was illegal until last February, okay? So this is all new stuff. And to me, it is the rocket fuel that will drive this entrepreneurial renaissance that I talked about earlier, okay? So these are some of the leading investors in this field, people that are more professional investors that you would go to. Jackie Novogratz, there's a great TED Talk that she does online if you're interested, or from the Acumen Fund. Linda Rotenberg, who is completely changing the way that people think about entrepreneurship in Latin America and now moving into the Middle East, okay? The gentleman that started eBay, Pierre Omidar, has completely changed what we considered the philanthropic model. So Pierre is a Frenchman, Parisian, who came to the valley, started eBay, made an insane amount of money. He's now one of the leading philanthropists, and he's bringing his technology sensibilities to the world of philanthropy. And he's another one that says, I'm not giving you money, I'm investing in you.